Ben Burgess will now talk to us about the question whether one really needs common ground, the value of political and philosophical debates across world view chasms. A very important question, especially in this time now. Um, thank you and take it away. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to do this. I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of an experiment because I'm going to be trying to combine a couple of things that I would normally keep separate. Uh, not that it takes any particular effort to keep them separate. They just kind of naturally tend to live in different boxes in my head. Uh, one of them is what I've been interested in uh, in academic philosophy over the years, which is actually not a uh, political philosophy or anything like it, uh, but a uh, philosophy of logic. And the other one is the kind of public facing political work that's been taking up more and more of my time in the last several years. And the genesis of the talk is thinking about the ways that um, there are certain kinds of objections that have been made to even kind of engaging with or trying to worry about the questions in some of the academic area. And also, you know, I think there are at least parallel questions about um, the value of some of the kinds of debates that I've often been engaged in in uh, the political sphere. And I think that those two sort of critiques are at least interestingly adjacent to each other and uh, might overlap, or at the very least that, you know, responses to them might overlap. And so it might be interesting to sort of bring these together. Uh, if it's not, maybe at least the disjointed parts will be interesting. We'll see. But uh, the, the sort of structure of the talk is that the first third of it or so, the first 20 minutes or so are going to uh, be essentially the first third of like a philosophy of logic talk that I would give at a university. In fact, it's a version of what I have done uh, universities before. Uh, and, you know, but I'm not going to take that to the point of sort of presenting, you know, the argument from my own positive view and all of that. I just I just want to give you enough to have some context for what I want to say about the meta level issue about the debate uh, later on in the talk, and then we'll uh, we'll shift into the political part. So with no further ado, uh, let's start with the philosophy of logic part. So what you're looking at, of course, uh, as the overwhelming majority of you know, is a truth table. Uh, so anybody who has uh, has taken an intro to logic class will recognize uh, what's going on here. Um, you know, just in case there are a few people who uh, signed up for the Zoom link because uh, they they like the political stuff that I do, and this is not fresh in their minds. Uh, this is a truth table for conjunction. So this is just a visual way of representing uh, the possible combinations of truth values, uh, which just means whether P is true or false, whether Q is true or false. That's what having a truth value is. We'll complicate that in just a second, but that's good enough for now. So uh, in this case, it's the one for conjunction for and statements. So if P is true and Q is true, then their conjunction P and Q is true. The other three possibilities in the remaining three lines uh, make the conjunction false. And the, the reason I wanted to start with this is to kind of put people into that headspace of thinking about this model of what we're doing when we do logic, that um, we're thinking about the truth values of statements, uh, where the truth values of more complicated statements are functions of the truth values of their constituents, and where once we start putting them together into arguments, what we're ultimately worried about is whether those arguments are truth-preserving, whether, in other words, so just a fancy way of saying, if the premises are true, then the conclusions uh, are true also. Uh, and, you know, whether there's a logical guarantee that that will be the case. Uh, and so what you see represented uh, here is this very simple, very clean, very intuitively compelling picture of uh, how logic works, that uh, everything is either a T or an F, uh, not both. Uh, and this is put under threat when you start thinking about the liar paradox, right? So this is 
a uh, really a closely related family of uh, paradoxes that go back to ancient Greece. There's a reference to it in uh, one of the letters of Paul, the New Testament. It talks about a prophet of Crete who says that all Cretans are liars. Uh, and it revolves around sentences like this one, right? This is called the simple liar sentence. It says this sentence is false. And if you think about what's paradoxical about that sentence, uh, it's that you say, okay, well, go back to the categories for the truth table. Is this a T or an F? And if it's T, it's an F. If it's an F, it's a T. Either way, it's both, which is logically impossible. So what's going on here? And I, a kind of natural first thought that you might have when you start looking at this is that, well, maybe that sort of simple picture in the truth table is wrong. Maybe it's like a good enough approximation in most contexts, but maybe the more complete and accurate truth tables should have little blanks or maybe question marks or something for, um, for truth value gaps, for uh, statements that are neither true nor false. And that thought um, survives until you see the beefed up version of the paradox called the strength and liar, which says this sentence is not true. And now the problem is if it's neither true nor false, it's not true and it's not false. Uh, and if it's not true and it's not false, it's not true, which is what it says. So it is true. And we're right back to, uh, to square one. So if we want to think a little bit more deeply about what's going on here, it looks like there are a few uh, really basic assumptions that we could question to try to figure out what's going on, assumptions that are so basic that we might not otherwise consciously think about them. Uh, so one of them is uh, the universality of uh, Alfred Tarski's biconditional truth schema, usually just shortened to the T schema in the literature on this. Uh, that's the one that says that um, well, P, unquote, is true if and only if P, right? The, the sentence, snow is white, is true if and only if snow is, well, white. Um, and once you plug uh, a sentence like this sentence is false or this sentence is not true into the T schema, you get these paradoxical truth conditions that that sentence, you know, the sentence, this sentence is not true, is true if and only if it's not true. Uh, so that uh, is the uh, the first of the three sort of fundamental assumptions that seem to be at work here. Second one is the law of excluded middle, LEM for short, which again is supposed to be universal. It says, you know, this could be any, any statement P, that either P or not P, that those are the options. Uh, and finally, of course, the law of non-contradiction or LNC, which says not both, right? So put together, LEM says uh, everything is either true or not, and law of non-contradiction says can't be both. And so if these are the fundamental assumptions that put together make the paradox look insoluble, then you have a few options. Of course, um, you could just not think about it, which is a option that the overwhelming majority of the human race and indeed most professional philosophers um, quite successfully and fruitfully um, pursue. But if you are for some reason going to think about it and try to figure out what's going on here, then uh, it looks like on you know kind of first glance, we have three options, um, which I've ranked here again in a first glance sort of way in the order of the least weird to the most weird, uh, the least weird is still pretty weird. And we can fact, we could doubt these rankings uh, and we will doubt them in a moment, but just at first glance, it seems like, okay, well, one option is you could uh, deny certain instances of the T schema. So for example, the late Gilbert Harmon uh, in his uh, 1986 book, change of view, which I would imagine uh, some of the academics here are familiar with, because uh, if you're an argumentation scholar, this is the sort of thing that would be interesting to you. Uh, it's all about how to think about reasoning and what the relationship is between reasoning and logic and issues like that. And in that book, you know, he has a brief discussion of the liar paradox where he says, well, uh, 
maybe we shouldn't think of the tea schema, you know, the way that people normally think about logical principles is something that holds universally no matter what. We should think of it as a sort of uh, all else being equal, something that's generally going to be true, but it could break down in certain instances as with these paradoxical sentences. Um, next up in our ranking, uh, we have excluded middle denial. So uh, Hartree Field, for example, who's actually an external member on my dissertation committee, uh, has a 2008 book called Saving Truth from Paradox, where he takes this line. Uh, and um, the idea here, and you have to be real careful about how you put it, or else we're going to be right back to the problem we have with the strength and liar is that there are certain sentences for which you should reject the sentence. Um, and I think at the level we're doing today um, for the moment, I think all the important distinctions between words like sentence, statement, proposition, et cetera, that philosophers will worry about, uh, we are going to blur right over if they become important in the Q and a, we can certainly talk about them there. But uh, I'm I'm just going to sort of be sloppy and interchangeable for a minute uh, as we explain this so that uh, Hartree Field says, OK, there are certain statements for which you should reject the statement and you should also reject the negation of the statement. You should reject the claim the statement isn't true. Uh, and part of how that move is going to work is that he's going to make a distinction between rejecting something and saying it isn't true. Um, and, you know, he thinks those are different and that this is going to help us to uh, solve the paradox. One thing I think it's worth briefly noting about the strangeness of this view is that it's very difficult for anybody who's advocated this to make any kind of affirmative statement about what this the status is of these paradoxical sentences by virtue of which you should reject the claim that they're true and you should reject the claim they're not true because the second you sort of have a little bit more to say about what's going on with these sentences, you say, okay, I've got, they have this status, right? They're defective with a capital D. The second you do that, a um, clever and annoying person could come up with a sentence for you. Like this sentence is either false or capital D defective. And you have, uh, you have big problems on your hands. And then um, next up, uh, at the sort of maximal weirdness, we have denial of the law of non-contradiction, a uh, position most famously advocated by Graham Priest um, in a bunch of books and articles uh, in uh, my dissertation, which was about this, and uh, this book about it for Springer, Logic Without Gaps or Gluts. Uh, he's the guy I spend the most time on just because he's made so many arguments for this, and I, I wanted to respond to all of them. Um and his position is called uh, dialetheism. If uh, the term is unfamiliar and, uh, and you, you need a device to help you remember it, uh, this joke is not original to me. But if you have a question about religion, who do you ask? You dial a theist. Um, and, um, but of course, the actual meaning from the Greek, die, and then aletheia is uh, like two truths. Uh, and uh, what it means is that Reese thinks that there are true contradictions, that there could be statements that are logically inconsistent, but objectively true. All right. That I think is extremely weird and it's worth kind of dwelling for just a moment on, on why it's quite as strange as it is. Um, and, you know, beyond the sort of obvious that, you know, normally we think that in, in every context, just without even thinking about it, we just assume Okay, if we can show that, you know, there's no uh, better or more conclusive way of showing that something isn't true than to show that it generates an inconsistency, um, the strangeness doesn't even uh, stop there, right? So to uh, to think uh, think about this, uh, think about the difference between classical logic, which is the kind of logic that you learn in an introductory logic class that that truth table we started out with uh, represents, and uh the kind of logic you need to embrace if you're a dialetheist, which is uh, paraconsistent logic. Uh, there's a um, somebody, uh, Jeremy, who I went to uh, graduate school with. I'm not going to try to imitate the North Carolina drawl, but uh, I remember him telling me once that paraconsistent logic sounded like a combination of math and the Ghostbusters. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the distinction is that in classical logic, what are the fundamental structuring assumptions 
is that every argument with contradictions in the premises is truth preserving. In other words, it's never going to take you from true premises to a false conclusion because the premises are never going to be true. So all such arguments, all arguments with contradictions, in the premises are like valid for free, essentially. Uh, they're vacuously truth preserving. But of course, if you're a dialetheist, you can't believe that because if you believe they're true contradictions and you believe that contradictions logically entail everything, then take you know if you take that seriously, you're going to suffer a psychotic break from reality. That you know you'd have you'd have to say because you know the liar sentence is true and not true that the mood is made of green cheese and you know I'm 500 years old and I'm you know. Uh, not holding up 10 fingers, I'm holding up 3,000 fingers, but also only 10 and, you know, et cetera. So you have to reject that. But in order to reject that, that comes at a pretty considerable intuitive cost. Because, for example, one of the um, one of the argument forms that you have to regard as not valid in order to get your way around that inference from contradictions to arbitrary conclusions is disjunctive syllogism. So um, for, again, there are a few people, you know, sign up, do this, who uh, this is not uh, fresh in their heads, as I'm sure it is for almost everybody else. Just really quickly, disjunctive syllogism is the argument uh, that uh, from premises, either A or B, not A, to conclusion B, right? So if my keys are in my left hand or my right hand, and they're not in my left hand, they must be in my right hand. And that is just an extremely strange thing to say is uh, is not valid, but you have to do that. Now, that said, uh, I do want to question that sort of initial ranking of the strangeness of the options. Because excluded middle denial is, in fact, fairly strange. So this is an example I give in the book. Uh, this comes from a math column in The Guardian in uh, 2016, uh, where the readers were asked uh, to evaluate this problem. So Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. And the question is, is a married person looking at an unmarried person? And um, most Guardian readers picked C, cannot be determined. Uh, but that's actually wrong. The answer is yes, a married person is looking at an unmarried person. And even if it's not obvious why just looking at it, I think most people, once you get the explanation, it it becomes obvious because, all right, you haven't been told whether Anne is married or not in the setup of the problem. So there are two options. She's married or she's unmarried. Well, if she's married, uh, we know Jack isn't and we know Anne, uh, sorry, we know George isn't. So if Anne is married, then a married person, Anne, is looking at an unmarried person, George. If, uh, if, on the other hand, Anne is unmarried, then a married person, uh, Jack, is looking at an unmarried person, Anne. Either way, a married person is looking at an unmarried person, and the answer is yes. And again, even if you didn't uh, you know, put it together immediately yourself, I think once you, you make that realization, oh, right, either way, uh, that would be true, this seems undeniable. Uh, it seems just utterly incoherent to deny that this is the case, that a married person is looking at an unmarried person here. But hold on. In order to come to that conclusion, we needed the law of excluded middle. And because we know absolutely nothing about these people other than these three sentences, I, I don't know what our basis is for uh, helping ourselves to it here, except for the belief that it's a universal uh, law of logic. Um, and this isn't even to speak of probability theory where things get extremely strange. So classical probability theory uh, uh, is based on classical logic. So one of the core assumptions is that for every statement A, uh, the probability of A and the probability of not A are going to add up to one. If the weatherman says there's a 70% chance of rain, you understand that that means there's a 30% chance of not rain. Uh, and thus, if it doesn't rain, he wasn't lying to you. Uh, and... That assumption can't be correct uh, if this view is right, because surely it's a a priori logical uh, 
you know, commitment to say that uh, paradoxical sentences um, are are ones where we, you know, they have whatever the status is by virtue of which we should reject the claim that they're true and we should reject the claim that they're not true, um, which means presumably that in the case of those sentences, probability of A plus probability of not A is adds up to zero, right? Sure can't add up to one. And on the other end, of course, if dialetheism is true, um, you know, maybe they should be able to add up to two. It's 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 unclear uh, how that would work. And um, I know there are people who've written more about this, but certainly if you read any of those uh, books that I mentioned earlier, like uh, Hartree Field's Saving Truth from Paradox or uh, Graham Priest's uh, first book about this in Contradiction, or we can throw in J.C. Beale's Spandrels of Truth, in every case, if you go, you know, if you do a search within the uh, the text for probability, you'll find a passage sort of noting the problem, but uh, they don't really say much about uh, what to do about it, uh, which seems like a pretty big lacuna given the role of the probability calculus and ordinary reasoning and the way we think about everything from predicting the weather to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, and really... I think that you could even make an argument that it's a three-way tie for weirdness uh, between uh, denying excluded middle, denying non-contradiction, and denying the T-schema. So in the book, I have this example, a conversation between Duck and uh, Tessa and uh, Richie. Anybody who spent as many hours of their life watching the TV show I'm drawing these names from as I do will will know where I got those. But um, Duncan says Snow is white. Tessa says that's true. Richie says, I disagree. Tess says, you disagree that Snow is white? Richie says, no, I disagree with what you said, not with what Duncan said. Of course, I agree that Snow is white. I just don't think it's true that, quote, Snow is white, unquote. Um, if this sort of reaches your ear as, as basically wrong and confused as anything can be, as, as be, sort of sub-wrong, then um, that I, I think... You know, you have some reason to think that this is um, that at the very least, the weirdness gap between these options uh, isn't as great as it seemed to be. Uh, and in the book, I, you know, try to come up with a way out of this unappetizing trilemma and show that we can avoid all of these options. Um, I'm happy to take that up in the Q&A if anybody wants to talk about it. I'm only too happy to do that. Uh, but um, but I, I want to move on from this uh, because I, I want to talk, pick up the other thread of uh, of the discussion, and then see what we could do to tie them together. So uh, the best way to bridge these topics that I can think of is just to point out a um, autobiographical detail that was sort of funny to me at the time, which is that this you know this book about it. Uh, came out the same week that this happened. Are you a straight up socialist or are you a democratic socialist? The reason I put democratic in there is because there are obviously countries that have, you know, called themselves socialists that have not had things that I care about, like, you know, free speech and, you know, multi-party elections. And, and, yeah. and so I certainly don't want to associate myself with that. But I care very much about a socialized health care, tuition-free higher education so people can go to school without being, having to be in debt for like decades, which is obscene. And I do think that the level of inequality that we get from our current system is indefensible so uh these are kind of odd extreme opposite ends of the stuff that i do that's going to reach the most of the fewest people um i uh i you know the book i pretty much wrote for a few dozen people who uh who are um are sort of specialists in the same thing and and this clip that we i just showed you the first half of um it's a YouTube short, which is like YouTube's version of a TikTok video, essentially, uh, has 1.1 million views on the uh, Give the Argument YouTube channel. Um, it's uh, a little bit of a black box now how many people watch the Joe Rogan experience, but because uh, it's moved to Spotify, it doesn't keep the public numbers, but a lot, right? Seems like uh, seems like a fair, uh, a fair guess. And uh, this, you know, so in that, 
in that exchange, we're trying to do a few things at a time, which represent a different set of challenges, uh, you know, which you always have in contexts like this, which are to try to communicate a set of ideas that are all important to you in, um, in a way that is very brief and uh, isn't going to just strike a big portion of the intended audience as esoteric crazy talk. Uh, so in, uh, so in this case, you know, responding to that kind of funny question, are you a straight up socialist or a uh, democratic socialist uh, trying to, uh, to get across uh, the ideas that, um, that I'm not an undemocratic socialist, you know, the sense of being a Stalinist, but uh, certainly support, you know, social democratic reforms like, you know, free healthcare, but, you know, don't have political horizons that are limited to it. I think that the larger system itself generates unacceptable levels of inequality. Uh, don't use phrases like capitalist property relations or whatever, because I don't think they would land in, uh, in that context. Uh, but this is, so this is maybe the highest profile example of a kind of thing that I've been doing a lot for the last few years. Um, I, I wouldn't call this one a debate exactly, uh, given the way that Rogan does the interviews, the fact that his own politics are sort of, um, often unpredictable combination of, of influences and impulses that vary over time, I think would be fair to say. Uh, but, uh, there, there have been a fair amount of things I've done in the past that, you are straight up so uh, that are, uh, actual debates. So Trying to give you a representative list here of uh, ones of those that I've done in the last several years uh, that, you know, without making the the font too small, uh, described in, you know, a couple of cases, possibly in tendentious ways. But uh, the uh, but this is so, you know, have done all these debates with people like um, Charlie Kirk, who's the founder of Turning, you know, Turning Points USA. It's a very well-funded conservative organization. Or Yaron Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute, or uh, Douglas Wilson, who's a megachurch pastor. Um, and uh, in some, you know, high-profile examples, I left them out of the slide because I really wasn't sure how to uh, describe them. Uh, so in the summer of 2022, I did this uh, debate in New York with. Uh, uh, Tim Poole, James Lindsay, and Tulsi Gabbard, which uh, I remember I was telling my editor, Jacobin, the week before that I was going to be doing this, and she told me it sounded like I was describing a dream I'd had. It's like, oh, yeah, that Tulsi Gabbard was there for some reason. Um, and the obvious thing that all of these people that I've just listed off have in common is that these are people whose whose worldviews are deeply different from mine. Um and I've certainly done debates with people who I was closer to on, you know, fundamental premises. We were arguing about narrower bands of topics, but I don't, not really interested in talking about those ones today because I think the sort of uh, purpose of those is a little bit more obvious on the face of it. It's a little bit uh, clearer how you could make sense of the the project of debating people who you might agree with on, uh, you know, the sort of most fundamental issues and you're disagreeing about strategy or tactics, or even you're trying to adjudicate secondary principles on the basis of uh, more basic uh, fundamental shared principles uh, that, you know, that I think all kind of, um, you know, makes sense on its face. Whereas there is a whole series of, of objections that you could make to the uh to the project of debating people who uh who have just fundamentally on the most important issues um clashing values or worldviews so uh there are you know i've encountered over the years like you know several different reasons we're going to do three to think that this might be at best a waste of time right that nothing productive or fruitful is going to come out of it, maybe worse than a waste of time. Maybe I'm actively doing harm by doing this. So let's uh, let's let's think about these. Uh, so uh, I don't know that this is exactly going to go from the the most uh, the least to the most plausible, but the uh, the last we are going to end with the one that I want to spend the rest of the talk focusing on. But uh, the first uh, that I'll often hear is about platforming. The idea is that uh, it's it's bad 
to provide a platform to uh to bad people who have bad views uh that you know when you appear on stage with somebody like that uh then you are essentially an accomplice to the spreading of their bad views to uh to the audience and there are a couple of different ways that you could respond to this concern um and you know i think the the first is sort of more um obvious uh in you know and you know the second is maybe more interesting but we'll we'll do both of them because i think they are both correct so the more obvious uh, one is that, you know, I would love to live in a world where the math worked out to make platforming concerns um, have legs. But sadly, uh, in the vast majority of these cases, we really don't. I'm much more a uh, receiver than a giver of platform in, uh, in most of these cases. Um, you know, Charlie Kirk, for example, has a much bigger audience than I do. He's uh Charlie Kirk had a speaking slot at the last Republican National Convention. I guarantee you that I will not be invited to do that at the next Democratic Convention. So uh, that's uh, so, you know, I, I think that if you're sort of concerned that, you know, people that you're an accomplice to the spreading of bad views, would you provide people with platforms? That would, I think, be much more of a concern for people who think my views are bad than vice versa in most of these cases. And it is easy to kind of rest on that response because um, I think rhetorically it's it's fairly effective. And again, it is obviously true, but I, I don't think it quite gets to the most interesting nub of the issue. Uh, and, you know, there, at least with people who, you know, nominally share my worldview, you know, who think of themselves as being socialists, um, I would argue that there is a, a deeper problem with the, the sort of platforming concerns and the sort of view of ordinary people that are revealed in those concerns. Because if you think that the core premise of socialist politics, as CLR James said, is that every cook can govern, that you know you um, that you have this level of trust in ordinary working class people that they could run their own workplaces and societies and, you know, and, and uh, have this kind of collective self-determination, uh, then I would really question how that fits with this kind of contagion view of bad ideas, that, uh, that bad ideas uh, are something that if, if they're kind of allowed to run rampant to the populace, they're going to infect people. Uh, and, you know, so in order to prevent this infection, you need like an intellectual CDC that, you know, you need to have benevolent liberal technocrats sort of pre-screen ideas to make sure they're not too dangerous uh, before uh, they reach people's ears, rather than trusting people to be exposed to different perspectives and the arguments for them and to make up their own mind. Because if you believe the first thing, it doesn't really sound to me like you believe that every cook could govern. It believe It sounds to me like you think that liberal technocrats should govern, which, you know, is very much not my politics. Um, but then uh, there is a whole bundle of objections that you'll often hear where people say, well, nobody's ever persuaded by debates. At the most extreme end, I'll hear people say nobody's ever persuaded by arguments, uh, which which seems, I think, more obviously false. Um, but uh, I, I do think that the two to go together because of course if you think that people are going to be persuaded by arguments uh at least in some cases uh then uh then debates are a place you know even if we're using the word debate in a very narrow way not to re represent any kind of clash of opinions but uh the sort of public spectacle debates that i was really talking about in that earlier slide well it is still true that one of the great advantages of doing that is that especially in a media landscape as fractured as the one we have right now, where people are very easily siloed into different information bubbles, this is one of the only chances you get to talk to somebody else's audience. And so this is one of the only chances that people get to be exposed to certain arguments that they would otherwise not see. And um, of course, uh, if you, if you're, when you say no one is ever persuaded, uh, if what you really mean is that none of the participants in the debate are ever persuaded, it's at least less implausible. Of course, uh, you know, even people like the ones that I just mentioned uh, do sometimes have changes of views themselves. 
Uh, but it is fair to say that by the time enough of your personal and professional identity is bound up with a certain political perspective that you are doing things like this, you know, emotionally, it would be extremely difficult to change your mind about some of these things. And it does still sometimes happen, but it sort of becomes at the level of like a religious conversion or deconversion at that point. And, um, and that's usually not realistically the goal to induce it to happen. The point of a debate, you're never trying to convince the person on the other uh, the other side of the stage or the other side of the YouTube split screen. You're always trying to persuade whoever's persuadable in the audience, you know, which could mean people who are genuinely on the fence. It could just mean people who, you know, might have a certain perspective, but you know, you caught them at just the right point in their personal arc that they're open to something else. Um, and there are all of these um arguments from empirical evidence that people bring up uh to uh to back up this uh this anti-persuasion point of view there's a whole at this point there's kind of a whole anti-persuasion empirical literature uh there are all these studies that are supposed to show that persuasion doesn't really work but i have to say um these strike me uh very often as you know kind of a caricature of uh the kind of empirical studies that are designed not really to study the issue that people are interested in, but uh, the uh, the issue that people have figured out how to empirically study. So uh, it's not so much, you know, all of these things, studies that show, oh, well, people will actually double down after they've, you know, after they've, they've gotten like this disconfirmed information or good arguments or whatever. It's like, yeah, if the question is what's somebody's reaction going to be in the next 30 seconds after they hear it, then of course, of course, they're going to double down. Everybody should know that just by introspection. Uh, you know, if you think about times in your life, you know, the the first time you hear a really good argument for a view that really conflicts with something that's important to you, your initial response is probably going to be irritation. Uh, it takes a while to sort of admit to uh, to yourself that you were wrong. Uh, persuasion is slow. It's cumulative. Uh, we, we know this. Uh, you know, if the, the question is, you know, do people generally have like road to Damascus conversion experiences the moment they they hear a good argument? Then of course the answer is no. That's not how persuasion works. But that doesn't mean that persuasion doesn't happen. And certainly on an anecdotal level, um, I've kind of never met anybody who pushes this line whose own life isn't a counterexample to the claim, right? Uh, it's I mean often to sort of do a stylized version of this, you know, oftentimes when, especially if I know the person a little bit, when we start to talk about this, they're like, wait, really? You don't think that people are persuaded by arguments that they change their minds? I mean, you, uh, you know, you grew up in a conservative evangelical household and you became an atheist when you were 17 because you started watching Richard Dawkins videos on YouTube. And then you were like a regular MSNBC liberal until the first time Bernie ran for president. And then you joined DSA and now you're like halfway to Maoism. And you're going to tell me that people don't change their minds or they change, they don't change their minds because of arguments. All of these changes were totally arbitrary. You didn't have reasons. Uh, the expression of those reasons by other people didn't, you know, didn't play a role in their evolution. And that that just strikes me as kind of silly on its face. And and I think um, even, you know, and, you know, you could say, well, anecdotal you know, data or the sort of testimonials that anybody who does a lot of debates will get from people who say they were actually persuaded and this this played a role in persuading them don't really matter that much because it's statistically insignificant. But uh, I, I do think that the, uh, the the strong common sense impression that people that persuasion is a thing that happens uh, should have some weight until we get much better empirical evidence against it than uh, that I've seen. But the objection that I'm really interested in here is that it's just not interesting or fruitful or productive to debate people that you don't share enough premises with that, you know, if the sort of you at a fundamental level, you care about the same things, then you can have a debate about kind of what to do in light of that, again, tactically, strategically, or even even on normative issues that might be secondary normative issues, you can have debates about that. But if you just disagree about the most fundamental uh, premises, the most fundamental value commitments, then uh, then then what can you possibly be doing uh, when you uh, when you engage 
in, in a debate. You know, what, what good could that possibly serve? Who could that possibly persuade? And uh, so I want to sort of drill down on that in, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last portion of the talk uh, by thinking about some concrete examples. Uh, so uh, this is from a debate that I did with a guy named Dave Smith, uh, who is uh, was it wasn't on the earlier slide, but he's a libertarian podcaster and a comedian, and um, we uh, we did uh, you know we did two debates. Uh, first one was in 2019, and I, I couldn't find a video of that to uh, to uh, to get the still from since that's long since disappeared behind a paywall in his podcast, which honestly I'm kind of grateful for. As 2019, I wasn't very good at it yet. Uh, but in uh, this, then the second one is uh, from 2020. And the reason I'm thinking about this as an example is that a lot of the arguments in that case revolved around something called the non-aggression principle, which is something a lot of libertarians uh, believe in adamantly, which is that they think that it's sort of intuitively obvious, or maybe even that they have some sort of fan a priori argument for the idea that it's like universally morally wrong to initiate the use of force against people or their property. And uh, they think that uh, libertarian political conclusions uh, follow from this. And the sort of point that I'd always make in these debates, which is derived from points of sin made by people like Matt Brudig or like G.A. Cohen uh, in his paper, Freedom and Money, or possibly Money and Freedom. I never remember which way around it is, but it's one of those, uh, the one on Isaiah Berlin. Uh, which is that, okay, the part about, this, you know, it at least, you know, I, I think it's probably implausible to say it's universal, but at least the idea that there's an all else being equal prohibition against initiating force against the, somebody's person has a certain plausibility. Uh, this is why you know, I would care about abortion rights, for example, um, that, you know, this sort of principle of bodily autonomy. Uh, but when you talk about, uh, initiate force against people's property, against their property, then the obvious question is, well, what do you mean by their property? You can't mean property that just happens to be in their possession or else repossessing stolen property would uh, would violate the non-aggression principle. You can't mean uh, property that's legally theirs because uh, if what you meant was property that they have a legal right to, then uh, the non-aggression principle couldn't be used to, gr to ground objections to redistribution by the state, which, after all, is legal. Uh, if you know, if you pass a law uh, mandating uh, taxation uh, for you know redistributive purposes, for example, or even a law mandating you know nationalizing the means of production, then uh, then in fact uh, the person that's being redistributed from does not have a legal right to that property. So at that point, what you're really talking about is a moral right to uh to the the property in question and at that point i think the argument becomes exposed as question begging in a basic way that you're saying it's morally wrong to take away property that people have a moral right to i think that's a vacuous principle that everybody could agree to you know that um you know it could be a capital c communist and agree to that of course right um the question where all the action is is at uh what property people have a moral right to and, you know, my argument would be that the non-aggression principle serves as a kind of conjurer's trick, you know, look at my, you know, look at my face, not at my hands, uh, while, uh, while the real argument is going on. Now, of course, you know, you could have a fancy libertarian uh, view of property rights, like the one advanced by Robert Nozick, for example, uh, which, you know, simplified and flattening just a little bit, you know, uh, for the sake of brevity, you know, says that, um, you know, as long as there's no force or fraud, then uh, whatever kind of distribution of property sort of falls out from uh, from letting a free market process play out and the chips fall where they may, that's what people have a moral right to. And once we're not pretending that we're having a quasi-pacifist argument about initiating force, once we sort of hone in on the actual moral question, I think that it becomes a much sort of better argument for people like me, because I think that there is an innate intuitive plausibility to more egalitarian theories of who has a moral right to uh, which resources. Or for an even more extreme example of a uh, kind of worldview clash, uh, this is from a debate I did around the same time with uh, Jeroen Brook, 
who um this might be outdated but I, I looked this up last night to make to see what exactly his title was is the uh what i saw is he was the chairman of the board of the ayn rand institute and um and there it's an even more uh extreme gap because you know the sort of shape of the political difference is gonna largely be similar to the one with dave smith but in this case the sort of moral principles of dispute are even more fundamental because uh he's a he's a randian he's gonna say that uh altruism is uh is is bad uh that uh, that it's actually um it's actually virtuous to just aggressively you know pursue uh, your own self-interest and you know i would argue i did argue that somebody like Ayn Rand in making this argument has a sort of silly false dichotomy between this extreme form of altruism that almost nobody really advocates and no altruism at all. Uh, and, you know, without that, you know, the whole thing becomes much less plausible. But I think this is the kind of case that like really stretches the limits of the idea that we're going to have like important shared premises that we can use to adjudicate the unshared premises because the because the the sort of basic starting points, the most fundamental normative commitments are just so different. And you can really understand the objection that is just kind of pointless at this point. What is there to argue about? And thinking about this, I uh I started to realize that this this exact point about um engaging in arguments uh that where the sort of most basic premises are unshared is one that I've seen before in a completely different context, the context that we started the talk with. So here is um, one of the most uh, important analytic philosophers of the uh, late 20th century, David Lewis, uh, explaining why the thing that I wrote my dissertation and my academic monograph about is a waste of time. Um, so uh, David Lewis was invited, uh, I think this is like 1999, to... Uh, write an essay for what became this book, uh, The Law of Non-Contradiction, -contra uh, New Philosophical Essays. Uh, and uh, he wrote this letter, Declining the Invite, which uh, actually, um, he died not that long after. And, you know, he ended up, um, I think it was posthumous. So I don't know if he agreed to it or his estate did, but uh, the letter itself is actually reprinted in this anthology. So he both did and did not participate in the law of non-contradiction book. Uh, but, uh, you know, in his uh, note declining, he says, I'm sorry, I declined to contribute to your proposed book about the debate over the law of non-contradiction. My feeling is that since this debate instantly reaches deadlock, there's nothing much to say about it. To conduct a debate, one needs common ground. Principles of dispute cannot, of course, fairly be used as common ground, and in this case, the principles non-dispute are so very much less certain than non-contradiction itself that it matters little whether or not a successful defense of non-contradiction could be based on them. Okay, so um, I want to start out by thinking about how Lewis's um, critique of the very idea of having a philosophical debate about this could be addressed in the philosophical context and then see if there's anything there that we could interestingly transfer over to the uh, parallel political issue. Um, so first things first, um, if the question is like, is anybody obligated to worry about this particular philosophical issue? I don't really think so. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make the argument that, um, that like you're sort of, fundamentally your intellectual house is not in order if you're not worried about this particular thing right so um you know i don't think you're going to philosophy hell for you know for not worried about it but uh i do think that there might be some benefits uh to worrying about it uh to engaging with um with the debate so uh the first certainly drawing from you know the stuff that i've written about that you know really from uh 2006, which is when uh, I took Otavio Bueno's Topics and Logic class in graduate school, which is when I started thinking about this because because uh, we read uh, part of In Contradiction in there. 
and I wrote a paper about it. And, you know, I was arguing with Otavio about it for, uh, for a long time. And, you know, I ended up doing my dissertation about this and, you know, up until some more political philosophy ish ones I've written in recent years, like all of the academic, you know, handful of academic papers I wrote were about this and the, that book, um, that I was showing you earlier, the logic without gaps or gluts. I had, uh, I wrote the first draft of that. I finished between like 2016 and 2018. And then I was kind of, by the time I got the referee report back, I was, I was too preoccupied with, with the political stuff to, to really devote the time to uh address that until the pandemic happened and uh and so i was it was 2021 sometime uh when i finished revising uh the uh, the book all of which is to say that i've spent a long time thinking about this uh you know very mistakenly if david lewis is correct and um and and sort of tried to reflect a little bit about some of what i got out of that you know i would argue that um that there is value in the rigors of entering into a dialectical context where um, where these ultra fundamental issues are in dispute. And so you can't, as David Lewis says, fairly appeal to them uh, because it forces you to think through issues that you wouldn't otherwise, uh, perhaps in a way that's analogous somewhat, although um, I haven't really explored this analogy too much to uh, the value of thinking about epistemic skepticism, right? Where your sort of uh, most basic empirical premises are sort of off the table by the nature of the uh, of the dispute. And certainly in the case of thinking about something like the liar paradox, um, if you can just appeal to raw inconsistency avoidance as like a good enough reason to ground uh, your solution, uh, then I think you miss a lot that you uh, that you that you end up having to get if you're arguing with people that you can't appeal to that uh, you know as um, as your only uh, as your only you know the only consideration to uh, to ground uh, to ground your conclusion uh, you know and related to that I think you certainly get a greater ability to articulate your own perspective and see how the uh, different parts of it fit together into um, into a larger whole, you know, which parts, you know, support other parts, you know, which parts are really independent. Um, and I think you find a lot of things that you'd otherwise miss. So um, we'll, we'll dip into philosophy of logic for, for just, you know, one more minute maybe to, uh, to just, just give a quick example of this. So uh, there's something called Curry's paradox, which is, um, a paradox about sentences like this one. If this sentence is true, the moon is made of green cheese. Uh, and the problem with that is that there is a logical principle called contraction, which is the inference for the premise, if P, then if P, then Q, to just if P, then Q. Um, if we were in a you know physical space with a whiteboard and uh, gravity was less of an issue, we could you know go through like a truth table or something to show you that that's true. Um, but, uh, in any case it, it is right. At least making standard logical assumptions and crucially just asserting their true con tr contradictions doesn't do anything by itself to undermine those assumptions. Cause those, those assumptions aren't really about non-contradiction. And the problem here is that when you feed Curry's paradox into the relevant T schema sentence, right? So you have, if this sentence is true, you know, if this sentence is true, the moon is made of green cheese. If and only if, if that sentence is true, the moon is made of green cheese. And you apply that principle, contraction, then um, you end up getting, you know, the proof isn't even that long. It's just a few steps. You end up getting the result that the moon is made of green cheese, which uh, doesn't seem to be. So something basic seems to have gone wrong. Um, and why this is interested in the context of arguing with dialetheism dialetheus is that dialetheism does nothing to solve this problem um that you know dialetheus like grand priest or jc beale end up having to just come up with a new solution to this that's separate from their solution to uh to the liar paradox 
Uh, cause of course they're not going to deny the T schema. If they were going to do that, they, you know, they, they'd lose the liar paradox as an argument for dialetheism. Um, so they have to have these sort of funny principles about how conditionals work to, uh, to, uh, in fact, Graham Priest says in his book to curry proof the conditionals in his, uh, his logical system. And, um, and it seems a, a bit ad hoc and, this is something that, that I think you're just more likely to to notice and think about if you're in this dialectical context of arguing with dialetheus that, oh, right, uh, this, whatever's going on here, it seems to be the same thing that's going on with the liar paradox and the solution that dialetheus would apply to the liar paradox doesn't seem to help us here. So this gives us some reason to think that um, that really whatever's going on with both is very different. Um, and again, I, I think that if, if you're just sort of doing like some very quick solution to the liar paradox, where you just find some principle that doesn't seem that bad to reject and justify its rejection on the basis of non-contradiction, then uh, I think you're less likely to, to see this point. So, so far uh, we've just been doing this sort of um, disinterested pursuit of truth reasons uh to think that there's some value in this kind of debate but uh there's also a final reason that we could add to this list is that to the extent that you think that what you're doing when you're engaged in philosophical debates like you're writing articles responding to other people's articles and journals is trying to persuade people which you know it's not always clear that that is what people think they're doing but whatever it's uh to the extent that that is the project um then one thing to notice here is that implausible consequences of a view will sometimes, in fact, I think often persuade people away from views, even if they're not as objectively fundamental as the broader claims that generate those implausible consequences. In other words, the sort of picture that you get in the David Lewis letter that, well, um, you're always, you know, you're always trying to justify you know, the sort of less fundamental assumptions by appeal to the more fundamental assumptions, uh, just as an observational matter. Um, certainly, you know, maybe that's true about the larger structure of justification. That's a sort of substantive epistemic argument. But um, but certainly experientially, that's not necessarily true about the way that, uh, that uh, persuasion works, that sometimes the implausibility of a view isn't as obvious to people when uh, they when they're considering the sort of more basic, the broader, the more fundamental claims. And then when you get what are maybe in some larger objective sense, a, a secondary instance of it, uh, then that might in fact be when uh, the implausibility hits home uh, because that's what you know gets around their defenses in some way or another. So I uh, want to do uh, one last uh, political example here. So this is um, Euron Brook. I uh, showed you a picture from my debate with him, but this this clip I want to play for you guys uh, isn't from my debate with him. It's from Sam Cedar's uh, debate with him, which uh, which happened uh, a, a while later. And you know, I I uh, I set up and I was very happy to uh, to see uh, to see how it went because of this part at the end. So uh, this is uh, from uh, I'm trying to think about the timeline here. Um, this is 2022 or 2021. I don't remember which one, but the uh, condo collapse uh, in South Florida had just happened uh, pretty recently when the uh, this this debate had happened. And this comes up at the at the end because you're on, of course, is arguing that, um, you know, in classic Ayn Rand fashion, there should be this radical divorce of the state from the economy. Uh, never the twain shall meet. There's just no legitimate role for government in, uh, in regulated economic activity. And Sam uh, brings up the condo collapse in Miami. Uh, the audio was okay for the, the earlier clip, right? I just want to make sure before I played this one. All right into the building in Miami. And they still didn't get it. They still blew it up. And I would argue the private, the private owners of that building did not yeah, respond but that's to the it. Point. The point is this, that in a, in, a, in a world in which the government doesn't have a building inspector, let, let me finish this thought. And then I have to run, unfortunately, right? Because I don't have a lot of time. Let me finish this thought. 
in a world in which I imagine there are many people that have a clear interest in keeping the building from collapsing. Certainly the owners of the building and the people who live there. Now, look, mistakes are going to happen in any system. Mistakes are going to happen, right? I, no system is going to guarantee that no buildings ever collapse. No system is going to guarantee that no people ever get sick from a drug or sick from food that they eat. But I like the incentives of the building owners, the people who own the condos, more than I like the incentive of the building inspector from the government. <laughs> now, it didn't work in this case. Man. It didn't work in this case, but I said that sometimes some, sometimes things are not going to work. But you know what? I also like the incentive of, in a free market, not in the world in which we live now where everybody hides behind the government, uh, of the insurance company that insured that building. Because um, they've got a lot of claims that they're going to have to pay now, and they're going to take a big hit. They, in a free market, they would have sent an inspector. Now, in the world we live in today, they don't because they rely on the government inspector, which probably was not a good idea. No, the, the government, government inspector well. made it quite clear that there were problems there. The yeah. private inspector, I'm sorry, you're right. years ago when you're the right. building was you're built, right. where the base was I'm stuff. sorry. The private inspectors also, the engineering company that was in there, the private owners of that building made the decision not to fix it. Now, were there a stricter government uh, regulations? Then, just, then, then why are we worried about it? Then they made a decision and they suffered the consequences. Because there's a hundred, uh, there's a hundred- People, people who made a decision, who made a bad decision and suffered the consequences of it. And what I like about that moment is that uh, it, you know, this is something that Sam is very good at. You'll often see him with libertarian guests and callers, giving people like a lot of time to sort of draw out their, their position. So he can, he can kind of draw out the most implausible consequences of it. And it seems to me that if, if anybody who's sort of initially inclined to be sympathetic to what you're on is selling is going to be persuaded by something that happens, this debate, this moment that I just showed you is a really plausible candidate for what that time is going to be, because it's very easy maybe to nod along with a bunch of premises about, you know, freedom and people make, uh, you know, making their own decisions and, uh, and it's sort of expressed at that level of abstraction. Some of the principles that, uh, that you're on is, is enunciating. In other words, some of the most basic, the most fundamental uh, value claims that he's making might sound plausible, but once you get to the result that it's, um, you know, let the buyer beware that it was really the fault of the people who moved into that building that they didn't, you know, I don't know, check the archives to see how often the building had been inspected and, you know, how structurally sound it was, you know, before they uh, they rented uh, the condo uh, and, uh, and, you know, maybe in, in, uh, in Iran's libertarian paradise, um, you know, there'd be the, the survivors would, would just file savage Yelp reviews. And, you know, if the, uh, if the, the owners didn't get out of town, they would sue them. Uh, once you start thinking about that, you might very well get off board with the more basic normative claims. And I think that there are a, a few broader lessons that you could draw here. And, you know, I think that the sort of, uh, there are political equivalents of the you know benefits of arguing with people across worldview chasms that we talked about in the philosophical case here that you know I think that you get much clearer in your own head about your own views and how the parts of it fit together and how you would justify it through the rigors of having to argue with somebody who doesn't who isn't just going to nod along with your most fundamental premises but I also think focusing specifically on this issue of persuasion I think there are some broader plausible lessons here uh, which we could draw out. Uh, one of them, and I think this is the kind of maybe the most basic mistake that's made uh, with when people say that it's it just can't be productive or fruitful or accomplish anything to argue with people who you know don't share your most fundamental uh, normative premises is that people don't always know what their most fundamental normative commitments are. In fact, I would argue uh, people very often don't know what their most uh, fundamental normative commitments are, that uh, moral philosophy would be very easy if they did. And in fact, it's, it's very hard. Um, and further that uh, one of the best ways of discovering 
what you care the most about is to consider cases where different things that you value come into conflict. So it's, you know, on paper, it's easy to say, okay, look, if you have this statement of the most fundamental values that is just fundamentally at odds with how I would state my most fundamental values, then what is there to argue about? But I would, I would argue that if you're thinking about persuadable people in the audience, um, you know, oftentimes people will nod along with radically incompatible fundamental statements of values because they haven't thought about the ways that those uh, those values uh, come into conflict. Um, and finally, it seems to me that just on a pragmatic level, uh, that um, you're less likely to engage in consideration of uh, of conflicts between values that might tell you something about which ones of those values you actually are most deeply consider uh, committed to, if you aren't exposed to uh, conflicted perspectives, and in fact, uh, doing debates with people who you disagree with on fundamental issues is a way of exposing people to uh, to conflicted perspectives and opening up that fissure. So perhaps not, in fact, a massive waste of time, or at least I really hope not. But uh, with that, I uh, will end the talk itself because I'm looking forward to hearing people's questions. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.